Okay, hi everybody. Um, welcome to the afternoon session of the Fundamental Physics uh, Group. Uh, our first speaker is missing, so we'll uh, we will, uh, make a little bit of a change in the schedule. We'll start with Daniel Palumbo, who will tell us about photon ring symmetries and simulated linear polarization images of M87. Oh, yes. All right, is that working? Yes, okie dokie. So yeah, I'm here to tell you about photon ring symmetries in uh, GMHD images, more or less, uh, particularly at low inclination as for MV7. I'm going to tease you with a an image of the magnitude of the complex scalar, uh, which is the polarization vector Q plus IU, it's not quite a vector. This is for a spin one half mad that's been time averaged. And you'll notice, I'm going to try and shoot a laser here. Yep. You'll notice that this increases towards the center in what I would call the direct image or the diffuse image, essentially the n equals zero image of the accretion flow. And you see a depression followed by a sudden increase, followed by another depression around the critical curve. And so we're going to try to make sense of this. But this seeing images like this is what inspired this project. And we'll need a little quick refresher before we get going on the beta two modes, which thankfully have been uh, discussed at great length at this conference, which uh, capture essentially azimuthal structure and azimuthal symmetries in uh, images like these. So in polarized images, we can describe these structures as being mostly radial or uh, sort of swirly. Uh, and we can associate these with axis, excuse me, axisymmetric uh, magnetic field patterns in the underlying image because we're seeing them uh, face on. We're essentially looking down at the spinning top. And so we do essentially a Fourier transform around as an equal angle uh, to project out these components, which we normalize in such a way that they scale with the image resolved fractional polarization and they carry structural information as indexed by this uh, number M. And so we care a lot about this M equals two because the M equals two mode or beta two mode uh, is what carries uh, this projection of axisymmetric structure. And so just looking at these, uh, we have a complex number with real modes associated with radial or circular structure and uh, positive and negative uh, complex modes, which are handedness of spirally structure. And this is exactly like uh, CMB sort of E and B uh, uh, polarization. And so at this point, if you have paper and pen with you, I want you to draw this shape, draw a radial spiral, or excuse me, a radial uh, EVPA pattern, and just flip it upside down. And you'll see something that's still radial. Yvonne, I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you draw on a piece of paper, which I recommend you do if you have it, this handed spiral at the bottom left, if you flip that over, you'll see something that looks like the bottom right. So what we observe is that the real modes of beta two are conserved under flipping your viewing angle, whereas the imaginary ones are complex conjugated under a flip. And so the intuition I hope to impart is that the image that is seen by photons which have been emitted from the bottom side corresponds to a flipping of that piece of paper that you just drew on. And we can actually see this in uh, analytic results and in uh, experimental results or you know, simulation results. So there's two papers that I want to shout out, which sort of informed a lot of my thinking. One is Alejandro's work on uh, the, essentially observing that the photon ring region in images tends to be depolarized. And she has a lot of excellent explanations for why geodesics, which pass through more material might innately be less polarized. And we certainly corroborate that. And Min Himwich has results uh, that point out the Penrose-Walker constant should complex conjugate across high end sub images in curve. And this makes some assumptions uh, that are, are, are generally reasonable, especially as we go to higher frequencies and especially MADs, et cetera. But uh, this result of the Penrose-Walker constant complex conjugating, you can actually work out the short shield face on limits of this prediction. And indeed you get that in, sh in sh uh, short shield space time with an equatorial accretion flow, which you view face on, the beta two parameter is exactly complex conjugated across subrings. Now, optimistically, we're not really in exact Schwarzschild, we're not really face on, but we can say we hope that the polarization vector 
from adjacent subimages to just to then go like the real part of beta two. If the beta two is purely imaginary, these things should cancel exactly. And less optimistically, it should go like the real part of kappa, which is the Penrose Walker constant. And in the uh, sort of limit where we are at high n, these uh, kappas are just complex conjugating across each n. So it should go like the real part of kappa for essentially all high n. And so what we see when we actually look in images where we can break down the n equals zero and n equals one and look at cross sections of radial slices through the image is that we see that spiral images, which again, these are imaginary beta two, partially depolarized in the photon ring region because it, precisely of this effect. This is a destructive interference effect between oppositely handed spirals. And so what's being pointed out here in this cross section, and the, the top is a little messy, this is the uh, random snapshot, at the bottom this is the time average, is that when you take a cross section that's dominated by one particular polarization, in this case, I can't even see my own plots, but this looks like it's dominated by positive U in the direct image. When you look at the sub image in dotted red, you see that the opposite sign of U is dominant and has slightly higher peak brightness. And so what causes this remarkable signature where the uh, polarization uh, norm drops and then increases, then drops again, increases and then levels out is essentially the sign of Q going through reversal and then bouncing back up. And now this isn't uh, you know, completely generic. If I did this slice along a different uh, radius, you, you would see U, you would see a mix, but the general picture is the same, which is that for relative tunings of the peak brightness of n equals zero and n equals one, you might see a dip. You might see a, a dip that punctures through zero and actually flip sign. But in general, if you have a spiral polarization, you will see some amount of depolarization in this region. And here we're just looking at a sane. Uh, this is a, a sane chosen. Uh, this is one of those high spin R high F1 models, which everyone loves and hates, where because this is almost perfectly radial, we have almost completely constructive interference between the sum at uh, the n equals zero and n equals one. And so we did this for the whole GRMHD library, breaking this down across R high and spin. And so first we're looking at the high R highs. These are more uh, Faraday depolarized. These are also more favored for both M87 and SAT J star. And what we're looking for here with MADS in blue, SANES in red, n equals zero images in solid circles and n equals one fittingly with rings, we see uh, what we're looking for is patterns where the distribution for n equals zero and n equals one are separated vertically. This is the beta two complex plane. And so a complex conjugate corresponds to a vertical relation. And so in the few places we see this pretty clearly, even at high R high, which is somewhat remarkable. For example, at spin one half, this is a complex conjugation. This is roughly a complex conjugation. Yeah, it's, it's approximate. And remember, we don't expect exact agreement, particularly at higher spins or really anything off the mid plane. So we know these aren't an exact uh, fit, but there's something remarkable, which is that at retrograde high spins, we don't see a complex conjugation, we see a negation. So note that these would still depolarize. These would still reduce your polarization in the region of the photon ring uh, rather strongly, but it's not due, a, due to a complex conjugation. There's some other, uh, or rather it's not due to complex conjugation of beta two. But remember we have hope, this might be a kappa effect. We just don't have access to trivially to kappa in GRMHD. When we look at lower R, R high, we see much the same pattern with one other signature. Note that at the higher R high, in virtually every same, the same n equals one image is completely depolarized. This is in itself somewhat of a result, which is that the n equals one in same is Faraday thick, or at least that's how we interpret this. But at low R high, one in 10, the high spin sanes exhibit the exact same complex conjugation in beta two. But once you get any, uh, really any uh, substantial R high, depolarize in n equals one. So does this explain the depolarization that Alejandro saw? The signature to look for is that the fractional polarization in the region of the, the subring, which is what we're plotting here, or divided by the fractional polarization in the, in the same region, just in the n equals zero image, does this decrease in a sort of U shape, essentially decreasing sinusoidally with respect to the beta two phase. So you expect a U shape if this is sensitive to the, the uh, spiral canceling, 
and you expect a flat line if it's not. And what we see in the R high of 10 NADs, where this is a re relatively booming signature, is that for prograde spins, which is green, red, and purple, it traces out this U. But for the retrograde spins, it's not so clear. And in particular, for these retrograde high spin models, which I believe are in blue here, right? These are depolarized, but are not sensitive to the beta 2 phase. At higher R high, the uh, sub-image is even more depolarized, which essentially depresses all of the uh, retrograde models, and the U flattens a little bit. And so this, this other signature, which we see in the SANES as well as we increase our highs, it's like a general depression, a squishing, is consistent with taking a polarized N equals zero image and just simply summing it with a completely depolarized N equals one. We're essentially adding a Stokes I floor that's depolarizing everything uniformly. So I'll, I'll end soon. Uh, the last sort of remark I'll have is uh, Kerbam, which is this model fitting code I've been working on, has an, essentially gives you full access to all of these quantities and it's nice and optically thin and equatorial. And so you might ask, can we replicate the retrograde high spin mad behavior where it's not a complex conjugation of beta two, it's a negation of beta two. How do we produce this? And it turns out it's very, very easy. In this case, we have a model which has a, a modestly negative uh, beta two phase in the n equals zero, but in the n equals one, it, it's flipped by nearly 180 degrees. And this is for a model with at R of three with mostly radial infall uh, and modest vertical fields. This essentially tracks with mad intuition, which at high spin tends to pack in uh, most of its emission near the horizon. And what we see is that the Penrose-Walker constant is almost purely imaginary in the region of the photon rate, which is what we expect. If these things are complex conjugating and canceling nearly perfectly, this should be darn near exactly complex at the critical curve. And so I'll just end here. The takeaways are, particularly for MADs, because their n equals one subimage is not depolarized, they exhibit this beta two phase dependent cancellation in the photon rate. But abstractly, we can expect any level of either destructive or constructive interference between the n equals zero and n equals one, depending on the underlying space time and magnetic field geometry. And so uh, this is a geometric effect, which would be very exciting to observe because this would be a lensing signature. And it's a little easier to make sense of than comparable Stokes V uh, negation signatures that Monica and Angelo have identified. And I just want to uh, sort of point out that this is a very general property where you can see trade-offs depending on your emission region between things like magnetic field and space time and, and fluid velocity. So we really should be prepared to see any uh, relative polarization that, that you can imagine. And it will be a, a sensitive probe of a joint constraint on these quantities. All right, thank you. Any questions? Please. Quite an uh, so a large part of the talk was focused on how there is spin dependence on this uh, the effects. Is there mass dependence on uh, the polarization signature? So I, I, I understand that it's M87, etc. But are, are, are these effects dependent on mass of the scale with mass in any relative factor? I see. So the the mass of the black hole itself, not the, the density of the material. Okay, sure. Yeah, so we'd like to pretend that these are all sort of scale invariant, like you could scale the entire system up. Um, that's, I think, not exactly true. And you can uh, talk to George Wong about uh, flux fitting and, and the delicacies of the M unit and its relationship to the overall mass. But I, by and large, we would expect this to be scale invariant as long as the emission region is still tracking at roughly the same radius in the M. Right, so just to, just, to, just to clarify, so these are a decent globe of the black hole spin, but maybe not of the black hole. Uh, I see, yes. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't think this would be the most natural way to get at M over D. However, you do have a sensitivity to the emission region baked in here. So the, the Penrose Walker constant is going to depend sensitively on a combination of local magnetic field and uh, sort of emission radius and spin. And so this will jointly constrain that parameter space, and any constraint on emission radius is in turn going to put some constraint on M over D. So really where I see this happening uh, most powerfully is in 
for forward modeling emissivity, which of course I have to, to plug as the natural way to, to test these things, uh, because it'll, it'll, it's some weak sensitivity that will disentangle uh, probably other degeneracies. Any more questions? I have one actually. So uh, you mentioned that uh, what you told us about today is specifically uh, called for small inclinations. So what, what happens for the larger ones and, and what, what are small inclinations for your case? Yeah, so for us, I would, I'm, I, I, part of this is leaning on uh, some early work that I'm doing with George Wong, looking at effects of uh, inclination on theta two, where for, for me, small inclination means anything less than sort of 30 or 40 degrees. However, for this signature, uh, this is in principle something that holds regardless of inclination, but the effects become more sort of naturally visible as you are at low inclination and higher end. Um, or, or rather, even at high inclination, if you go to high enough end, these natural sort of conjugation symmetries will hold because all of your emission is essentially face on anyway, because it's coming at you in rings. This just becomes a little bit more messy to think about and represent pictorially at, at the higher inclination. But in principle, in the forward model, that doesn't matter. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Daniel again. Thank you. And our next speaker is Galin Gyulchev. So Galin will tell us about image of the thin accretion disk around compact objects in the Einstein Gauss Bonnet gravity. My name is Dan. So, as you see, I'm from Sofi University in Nigeria. So, I'm one of the kind of the so called object relativity activists. Our major focus is to consider the relativity properties of the elementary physics of the object. So, because of that, First of all, I want to tell that uh, I'm very excited to be here because uh, everyone has known that this is one of the uh, projects uh, in the art physics. I can say the point, so. Okay, so. Uh, What's so interesting so that uh, we are going to consider uh, this, uh, this problem for, for this uh, I will go to the bar. So he, he, every one of us uh, uh, knows that uh, if we think about uh, things in the context of objects, um, we have to consider the relativistic effects uh, of the light uh, and the distribution of the light near by of the object. So we know that uh, according to uh, the theorems of gravity, we just have to know what are the physical parameters of the of the object. So what is the mass, what is the angular momentum of the compact object or at compact objects uh, there is uh, a charge. Uh, and uh, are these compact objects uh, have uh, Pascal field uh, and so on. So, in the first case, here I uh, have made a brief uh, review of the major problems which we expect. And of course, uh, everyone, these problems are, uh, are known from everyone. I just will uh, pass to the last one. Uh, it's also very important uh, to consider the uh, how, how we look at the image of the concept of object uh, when we modify uh, the general relativity, when we are going to consider the quantum directions to uh, measure partial of, uh, of, of the graph. 
of the Einstein derivative. It also this uh, uh, we were going to consider the image which uh, only the Einstein tells the next character. So it also this uh, we concentrated our attention to uh, the first uh, general graphic uh, equation where we are going to consider the tangent of the energy connection which is uh, contracted with uh, electric uh, tensor and uh, how we can see uh, uh, the final result of the contraction is uh, just uh, related with the Gauss group uh, term which uh, uh, is appearing here. So uh, the most important thing in this uh, study is to understand what is uh, the value of the coupling constant which uh, uh, So uh, then the major uh, task uh, uh, goal which uh, is uh, assuming the static and spherical symmetric uh, metric of the space time uh, applied uh, to uh, this equation of, uh, of gravity uh, to do the metric which is written here. So uh, how we can see the metric Precisely this symmetries which uh, we have as possible. So, where the, the function f depends on the uh, coupling parameter uh, gamma. So, if we are finishing uh, with the task uh, of uh, examination of the relativistic uh, images of the compact of objects which, uh, which is described by this metric, uh, we can understand what uh, are the constraints about this. So, if we uh, start to study the metric, uh, we can see that, uh, first of all, it uh, describes in general two kinds of objects. The first one is uh, uh, the black hole. So, here we can see that if the gamma are written within the field gap between 0 and 1, we have this uh, representation of the black hole rises. And in particular, when uh, gamma is equal to 1, we have extra uh, and when gamma is equal to zero, we have a spark with the hole. So this is very good uh, uh, interval because uh, we will see after that uh, when we show the final result for the images that uh, really in a very good way we can understand uh, do we have uh, a black hole or we have a uh, uh, same graphic, for example. So if uh, in particular gamma is uh, bigger than one, we will have to make the same gravity in this case. And uh, in order to study the images, uh, we're going to uh, write the equation of the So we start from a uh, general form of metric and we start from the very basic metric. Metric we uh, write the equation of the field physics. So now we can see this uh, the equation of the deficit, which are first of all uh, different equations. So we have um, a simple solution to the Hamilton public equation, which uh, has a separation of the tables. And so we can attract the defective tensor, which we insert for the massive particles. And uh, here after, in order to study the images which are uh, appearing uh, in the same equation, we are going to assume first of all that uh, there exists as, uh, a, 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 a creation group exists around the uh, top of the object. Because of this, we are assuming uh, that uh, we have to split the task in two major uh, parts. So, the first uh, part will be the task which we are going to. Uh, to Examine the stability of the mass of uh, objects, uh, which uh, we will assume that they uh, exist. And the second part will be the elimination of the uh, open trajectories. Uh, and finally, to understand uh, what are the projections of the bottom in the, uh, the observers, for all observers' uh, sky. So, here on the, the last. Uh, uh, place we, you can see the system of the equations which uh, have to be solved uh, uh, when we apply these constraints of uh, the effective equation of the massive particles. And uh, 
this uh, form of protected pressure, uh, we know that uh, these are uh, these two of uh, first uh, objects are the integrals of motion which are first related by this way, with the coefficients. So they are uh, integrals of motion in uh, uh, the motion of the particles. And finally, we have the epithelium in the velocity, which is this uh, static uh, case uh, with a uh, very simple. So uh, if we are going to, uh, to, to study the stability of the particles and the action is following the intuition of the sparkle case, we know that uh, all of the particles uh, uh, possess a stable support orbits. When uh, the radius of the inner most stable orbit is equal to 6 times n, so every one uh, of the orbits which are uh, above this uh, value is stable, and every one of the orbits which are below this value will be unstable. So, because of this, this uh, uh, three equations which are uh, written here are a systems uh, equation where the last one is the most important because it is assumed that here, uh, if uh, this, uh, this equation is good, we have a so called in the most stable support orbit. Uh, so, we know that according to the mathematics, this is, uh, this is a condition which uh, it is, uh, it is the last stable support orbit. And, uh, if we apply all of these conditions and uh, uh, consider the, the above, uh, above equation, we just obtain this final equation here, which uh, uh, here uh, we solve in the and we will find the points. So, in order to do that, after that, I will show you the results, but uh, let's uh, just. Uh, uh, I pass to the second part of the task and uh, to go into the same of open orbits. So we know that these orbits are increasing because uh, all the relative phenomena are, uh, which are related to the shadows are closely related to the focus sphere. So uh, our major task here is what we sort of exist in this uh, time or not. And because of this, we are following the chain figure. So we write uh, the equation of the motion of the focus, we extract the effective potential of the focus so, here. And uh, one of uh, the major uh, or interesting uh, features which we uh, found is that uh, there is no exist only unstable focus orbits, but there exist and uh, stable spherical photon orbits because the second derivative uh, of the effective potential can be a positive and negative. We know that if it's positive, we have a uh, equation of stability, and uh, if it's negative, we have a uh, instability. So, uh, in order to understand what is happening uh, or to represent this behavior of this uh, uh, trend here, we just uh, plot, plot it uh, depending on the third uh, which represents the uh, equation. Particles, and we see that the black curves uh, resemble the behavior for the effective potential for the, uh, for the Schwarzschild uh, 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 case. Uh, first of all, but here they are represented for the, for the black hole case where gamma is equal to 1. So this is the extremum. Uh, uh, black holes which appear Einstein gauss uh, gravity. And the, the red curves are connected to the same equation when we have. Um, so uh, we see uh, here uh, for the first uh, time that uh, the behavior of the photon will be very difficult when we get a black hole and then we get a negative similarity because the black holes uh, will act uh, on the photon only with the maximum of the effective potential. So in this case, we get only unstable photon orbits, which Focus here, but in the case of the naked similarities, we have not only the maximum, but we have a minimum focal potential, which uh, stands that uh, we have uh, uh, and stable spherical photon orbits. So, this uh, is uh, very interesting because this stable photon orbit, we uh, 
inside the application disk. And this arises a very uh, important question. What is happening to the table with uh, the particles inside the disk? What is uh, the uh, maximum speed of the particles inside this where, where they uh, are nearby to this uh, stable corporate orbit and so on and so on. And in order to understand what is happening at the look, um, we are going to relate the integral motion. So uh, 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 the asymptotic behavior of the uh, uh, we assume that the uh, observer uh, is, is positioned. And uh, when we apply this uh, general equation here, uh, we uh, know that uh, this uh, zeta and uh, e here uh, are related to the integrals of motion, uh, respectively, uh, uh, zeta is related to the asymptotal uh, angle. Of the objects and the uh, data is related with uh, uh, Carter's uh, integrals of motion. Uh, so, because of this, uh, uh, if we uh, calculate uh, this asymptotic behavior of these quantities, uh, which uh, when they are uh, uh, substituted in the geometric equation, if we found this asymptotic system infinity, we found it to be observable from this number here. Which uh, again are, uh, are uh, integrals of motion, but now they they look like now they would look like the four four units of the increase over the over the observer step. So we solve uh, after that system equation for the massive particles and uh, obtain all these equations here. So the first uh, character is uh, the position of these two orbits. Uh, uh, and how do we behave with uh, the Cartesian parameter gamma? After that, we see that the focus here is lowest orbit uh, that we have for the people horizons. And uh, if we are going to understand uh, which orbits are stable or which are unstable, uh, we have to uh, understand the uh, the value of the second derivative of the potential, and we see that uh, it is positive here about uh, the two orbits. Uh, here inside it is negative. After that, uh, also inside this area K, which again became positive, and two green uh, strange curve here is the curve which uh, is related to the existence of the circular uh, mass of the orbit. So, uh, do all this work, it is not possible uh, here to attain physical uh, stable or, or, or so we, we didn't get a lot of there in this position. So, because this is for, uh, for this diagram, we see just that this uh, has uh, two, two different parts, and between this part we have a gap. So, we have to equation this to the Distributed on the objects. So here uh, we make a presentation of uh, this uh, plot uh, of the deprecation disk uh, and we apply a numerical ray uh, tracing procedure for, uh, for tracing of, of the light rays. And uh, we see, for example, uh, the focus ring here, which actually is one cross section of the focus ring. Uh, so all, all the uh, green. Uh, sorry, uh, that the uh, group blue reflectors uh, are going to be at the front of focus and all the colors are going to escape. So, here, very fastly, uh, 
I'm going to represent the final route. So this step here is the left uh, represents uh, the azimuthal deviations of the problems. Uh, we have a lot of information here, so I just uh, only want to show you this uh, different uh, intervals here, which are related to the different dimensions of the lines of the problems and what kind of the objects. And so from this diagram here, we can extract uh, all the possible solutions of the geodesic equations. And if we uh, map all uh, of the information here into the observer uh, sky, we obtain uh, this uh, uh, infinite number of solutions, which here are represented by continuities of only one single orbit of the equation distance. So we see that uh, uh, for different uh, orbits, uh, for the different uh, windings uh, of the bottom, we have a lot of continuities, and here they are extracted uh, for different bottom. So we see that uh, when we have uh, each of the uh, second order uh, actually. So the first one is this which is represented with the uh, red color here. This is the direct into the orbit, but uh, here yeah, all, all of these which are represented here yes, are the new that are the this. So we see that uh, the number time is going to decrease, and then it is uh, became more symmetric. So and finally the high is going to We obtain uh, simply quite the uh, subprojection of the photons here or over the observer sky, so we obtain the challenge. Uh, if we repeat this procedure for the inner location, this we obtain the same information here. So these here actually are the all the possible images of the uh, objects uh, from the inner uh, spectrum. So finally, if we repeat the same procedure here, we obtain all the possible uh, images uh, at the accretion distance, which comes from the accretion distance. Uh, so, again, we see that uh, because uh, of the use of the other K, uh, all of the images are going to, uh, to, to resemble the, the size of the shallow particle. So, here the last one, that inside the time. And uh, finally, if we uh, study the Mission rate uh, of the books of the energy of the equation is we can see how uh, assuming that the accretion disk, uh, accretion disk is thin and the uh, optically uh, optically thin, uh, thin disk, uh, we obtain these two results. So the first one is exactly for the first okay, for the second class is. Uh, for the down also you can see that they are only the same. Uh, so the, the difference here which uh, appeared in the uh, separate of the down is that uh, the, the disk is a little bit more to shrink with respect to the factor case and it uh, appeared here a little bit brighter with respect to the general characteristic case. And uh, if we continue uh, for this way we study the matrix in that the separation we see dramatically different uh, results. So, if uh, the black holes uh, is, uh, represent the classical uh, equation disk, so here for the matrix that situation, we uh, see a lot of images uh, which uh, may be more sensitive to the results for the world holes. So, we obtain their own the same results. But here, this, uh, this structure of the images comes from the effective behavior of the potential uh, with this different so here in this one uh, uh, here we briefly try to discuss all of this uh, thank you Galim any questions I have one actually. Um, so, all this was for a uh, spherically symmetric black hole, of course. And uh, how is it even the solution for a rotating black hole in Gauss Bonnet gravity? Is it known? Or is it uh, how hard is it to 
It's a natural thing to start with, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So here we have a whole synthesis. So first we uh, we find our results uh, by the numerical trace in which we have only applied to the rotation of saturation. So we need to do like a process. But this saturation is just to take the result to the full analytical process. So we compare the bottom and see if we have the result. So I know that there is such a solution related to the Thank so, you. So the interesting thing that uh, we will have a uh, strong distortion of the field. So we have to have this result with the world of Any more questions? Um, just a quick question. Sorry, just a quick question about the reflection component. So this is purely a consequence of the potential barrier reflecting photons back. What's the condition in the photon momentum to reflect them? Is it just purely uh, flipping the sign in the P to P thing for the momentum or something else? So you get these in the oh, final images that you show, because it's a naked singularity. So you'll have like one ring which is a speculative reflective ring, which would probably be the image part in the center of the image. And then you have lensing, and that's why you have all these inner concentric rings in your naked singularity ray tracing images. So my question is, um, what sets the condition for the reflection? So the behavior of the potential of the particles Because I'm curious if you know, is this really as a repulsive potential? Will you just reach that final potential and there's no longer a solution without avoiding the you know, kind of merging of the hit the singularity which you have to do and then you just manually change the momentum of the photo to reflect it? So is the reflection something that's inherent? You just keep implicating the blue desk equations, or is it something which has to be imposed in order to keep the solution? It's very interesting. Yeah, we obtain this result for, for uh, all the possible values of the photon. Only one situation is uh, very strange. This photon has zero information. Uh, so for the radio photon, it goes uh, straight to the spectrum. But uh, this case uh, has to be uh, taken this kind of dramatically this is what we can take a look at the problem of this region in the public way. But I believe that there is no problem with this. 
only in this case we will obtain not the uh, whole uh, closed uh, image, but in this situation we get to obtain in general one single uh, unit white box on this. But because uh, uh, the box has a zero surface, we cannot assume from the physical uh, that this surface will be very bright. We observe of Okay, if there are no further questions, then thanks, uh, Galina, again. Okay. Our next speaker is Petya Nedkova. She will tell us about observational signatures of exotic compact objects, image of thin accretion disk, and linear polarization. Hi, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to talk uh, at this meeting. It was a really nice meeting. Uh, thanks to all the organizers and all the participants. So, um, I will present some uh, work which was done uh, in collaboration with uh, my colleague from Sofia and uh, with Joseph uh, from Oldenburg. And part of this work is already published some uh, two years ago. And part of it is very recent work. We just submitted in the archive this week. So, so part of it is uh, yeah, uh, what we have done very recently. Uh, as promised in the title, I will talk about observational signatures, which could uh, distinguish horizonless space time from black hole space time in the imaging experiment. So the talk is divided into two main topics. So we have two distinct topics. First of uh, the topic is uh, about the morphology of the accretion images. So in this part, we will talk about signatures, which are a quality signatures. We just see additional structure in the disk image. So if we have horizon the side, uh, space time, we will have some structure. If we have a black hole space time, this uh, structure is absent. So this is clear yes and no. Okay. And in this part, we will be talking about making popularity. Uh, this effect will be demonstrated on naked singularity space time. But uh, yeah, we will see that it can, can be also more general. It could arise in other space times if they have certain properties. So in the next part of the talk, we uh, discuss effects which uh, are connected with the linear polarization from the uh, flux of the facing disk. So in this part, we are searching for uh, some signatures in the polarization properties. So either in the intensity or in the direction in the pattern of the polarization they can be qualitative to have some different qualitative pattern of the image of the polarized image or they can be quantitative just to compare how much it will deviate from the uh, polarization in the black hole space time and in this part we consider several world so this last part is the recent work 
Uh, okay, so let's start with, uh, with the first part. So, as I told you, the effect which we will be talking about, we discovered with native similarities to space time, in particular space time, when we were uh, making the study. But it turned out when we went down deeper and we uh, investigated how this uh, effect arises. So it turned uh, out that it can be more general than in this particular space time. But I will go uh, through the logic how uh, we uh, derive this effect and how this is found. And then I will tell you what will be the criteria in another space time to have the same effect. So uh, we were considering uh, the so called Janice Newman Winnicott native singularity. Uh, and uh, this, uh, maybe you know, this is a unique uh, static spherical symmetric solution to the uh, Einstein uh, equations with a massless scalar field. So, if you add a massless scalar field to the Einstein equations in vacuum and you require spherical symmetry, you will not get a uh, black hole anymore. You like uh, Schwab to the vacuum, you will get this uh, naked singularity space time. So um, this uh, space-time, the Janice Nima linear space-time, it has two parameters, mass and scalar charge. But for our lensing problems, mass is irrelevant. It is just a scale parameter. So for our problem, this is one parameter uh, class of solutions. It is characterized by the ratio of charge to mass. So um, according to the values of this ratio, this solution uh, functions in two regimes uh, with respect to the lensing properties weakly naked singularities and strongly naked singularities. Weakly naked, they uh, have lensing properties like structure. So they have, uh, yeah, broadly speaking, they have a photosphere and they behave very much like structure. Strongly naked, this is the interstitial regime. They have no photosphere. And on the right hand side in this figure, you can see the effective potential for the now geodesic. In Schwarzschild, in uh, weakly naked and strongly naked. So, in the strongly naked singularities, you can see this is the curve without uh, maximum. The potential is diverging in the region close to the singularity. So, it does a reflective barrier in the vicinity of the compact uh, object. So, of course, this will have uh, impact on the uh, properties of the image. Okay, in this uh, space time, we build the standards in this uh, model. As probably you all know, this is uh, uh, approximation uh, of a disk uh, when uh, you construct the disk just by taking uh, the collections of all the uh, particles moving on stable uh, uh, orbits in the equatorial space. So uh, the ra radiation of the disk, it was calculated in the similar paper of Norwich and Thorne. So it is given. Uh, the flux is given by this function, which is shown on the screen, and it depends only on the kinematic properties uh, properties on the orbit, uh, except for the mass equation rate, which is an unworkable parameter. So, otherwise, it, it is determined ex uh, exclusively by the uh, by the motion, by the kinematics of the motion on the orbit. Uh, and of course, this is the flux measured locally on the disk. So if you want to know what is the facts uh, which a distant observer will see, you modify by the um, uh, redshift. So in this way, you, you get the facts uh, at infinity or wherever you want, at some distant point. OK, and uh, we apply uh, this model. We built this uh, thin disk. And then we construct uh, uh, the images of this disk. Yes, so they will be seen by a distant observer. How we do this? By numerical ray tracing. We just retrace. Um, all the uh, now trajectories which are originate uh, from the disk and which will reach a certain observer. And uh, uh, with each pixel on the observer sky, we associate the appropriate facts. So in this way, you, you get uh, this kind of image here. Uh, this is image with inclination angle AT is not written on the slide, but yeah, it, it, it's not so important. So you, you get this image here. I'm sorry, I, I, there is no color code, but uh, red is uh, cold, so blue is hot. So the temperature is rising now from red to blue. And um, in this slide, I'm giving uh, the image for the weekly naked singularities as expected, as I told you, by even by looking at the effective potential, the image is very, very similar. Uh, qualitatively, there is a small uh, difference for uh, this weekly naked space time. It focuses uh, 
more strongly the geodetic. So the image gets a little bit lower, but it's like 5% different. Different the flux uh, is a little bit higher, the maximum of the flux is a little bit higher, but uh, qualitatively it's very same. So uh, you could say it's a very good uh, mimic of uh, a black hole in this regime. Okay, when you go to the strongly naked regime, then you get the interesting features. So you, you see, uh, right is uh, Schwarzschild, um, left is the naked singularity. So you, you get this, this structure here, this structure in the middle. Uh, and this structure in this particular model, it is bright. So this will be observationally significant. Uh, so uh, what will happen if you change this model? So uh, from my intuition, I would tell you, if you have a thick disk, uh, you don't stay with this thin disk, but you have uh, some disk with some uh, uh, different geometry, this feature will be there. Uh, just you need uh, the disk to be axisymmetric, not to get sphere. Okay. About uh, the radiation, I don't know. So <laughs> I cannot guess how bright this will be. So for this, you need to make some image of construction and design. So for, for the qualitative appearance of the feature, it will be there, how bright? Yeah, this is a matter of further study. Uh, okay, but uh, what uh, we can do still here? Um, okay, we did uh, this imaging just by brute force by numerically integrating the geodetics. But uh, what we are getting in this very, uh, why we chose this uh, simple model with uh, such uh, a lot of symmetries, uh, with uh, such a simple disk model, we chose this because we are gaining intuition. So in this very symmetric space time with this very uh, simple uh, disk model, we can track down how this effect arises. So that is why we are dealing with this very simple uh, problem. We can track down the effect, we can see exactly why it arises and we can generalize. So we can predict in which other space time, with, which, with what properties, we could have something similar. So on the next part, we are doing this, uh, we, ex we explain, explain the key point of this, this effect, why it is there. Um, in uh, this very, uh, very symmetric problem, we can actually construct this uh, image semi-analytically. So we don't need to do, uh, if we don't want to do the numerical replacing, we can uh, reduce the problem to simple integration. So just to solve it by the problem. And uh, this is why, this is because uh, uh, when we have spherical symmetric uh, space time, uh, the motion, the photon motion, it uh, actually it reduces to one dimensional problem. So we need to solve one integral which uh, uh, shows how the azimuthal angle varies with respect to the uh, radial distance or to calculate so called deflection angle. So this determines the trajectory completely. On the other hand, due to the spherical symmetry, this deflection angle, it's uh, connected with the projection on the observer sky. So uh, there is uh, this relation. So this relation, uh, the deflection angle, it is equal to some, I didn't give the explicit function here because I didn't want to uh, make the talk technical. But there is one explicit function of the inclination angle and uh, uh, suitable chosen coordinate on the observer sky, which is in this case, it's a polar angle, uh, which uh, yeah, this is uh, convenient for the symmetry. Uh, and here we add one term, which is uh, integer times p. This term uh, keeps track of the turning point on, on uh, how, how, many, how many turns the trajectory will make around the compact object. So, uh, if we don't have this term, uh, this is direct trajectory. If you add this, we uh, uh, put into the equation the possibility to have a trajectory making one half loop, two half loops, so, so, so. Uh, so we also introduce the strongly lensed trajectory in the equation. But in, uh, this this equation it defines completely the image. So solving this equation with particular boundary conditions, which are the radius of the source, the radius of the observer, and the inclination angle. You will give actually by solving this equation for every possible uh, ang uh, celestial uh, angle here eta, it goes from one to p, uh, two to p. You actually get the image of one circular orbit located at air source. So the solution of this equation gives you the image of uh, all the possible solutions, of course, uh, for all the possible eta 
gives you uh, the image of one uh, sexual or duplicated that are crossed. And by investigating the properties of this equation, we can clearly see how the double images, how they are right, how these central images, how they are right. So what is, uh, we just need to study the equation qualitatively. So uh, on the next slide, we do this. So we introduce this kind of <laughs> diagram. So the curve, the curve on the diagram gives you the integral, this uh, deflection angle. Those strips, they give the right-hand side. So we call them observational window. We have to uh, introduce some terms for them. So uh, those strips, uh, they are divided by the order of the images, uh, equal to zero, one, two, so on. To get clarity, to get clarity what kind of uh, we, images we are getting. So for example, here the uh, orange strip, the intersection of the orange strip with the curve gives you the, the images of order zero of a particular circular orbit. So here you already can see the key point at the head. The key point is the shape of this curve. The deflection angle. So for Schwarzschild, of course, you, this the deflection angle is diverging at the photon sphere. Here you don't get photon sphere. You should have uh, this integral everywhere regular. Uh, you should not have any point of divergence. So what can happen? It gets maximum and then goes down. Uh, now we look at the intersection. You see here two different portions of this curve intersecting our observational angle. And you can already guess. Those two different portions, they will get, they will uh, give two distinct images, which are disconnected on the observer sky. So here is what is happening. This is image for this one. So this thing and this thing, they are giving those two orange uh, 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 circles uh, on the uh, on the image diagram. This is the image uh, diagram of, the, of this result. So, this this uh, orange ring and this orange ring they correspond to those disconnected intersections of uh, the integral with the observational window and the blue thing is the image of the uh, first order uh, e equal to one image so this effect it's for one particular orbit but it is valid for any other orbit of the disk so each orbit will have such a double image one of the uh, orbit uh, one of the images will build this uh, traditional cat like uh, image of the disk, which is also in the thing. The other one will uh, give another image, which will be very compact. They will pack into some small region in the center. So the whole disk will have a second image in the center of the first image, which uh, will give those bright uh, ring in the middle. And now you can uh, generalize any data which doesn't have a photosphere and have this reflective behavior in the vicinity of the contact object to give you such a for the uh, flexion angle. And so as a consequence, it will lead to similar patterns. As a consequence, it will bring this uh, central bright ring. So you can also guess that this is a class of naked singularities, but maybe you will have here also regular black holes. It's very, very possible because they can have this reflective field in the, in the center. If they don't have a photo sphere, it's very possible to get into this class. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't have time. So I, I, I stopped here. You didn't hear about the second part, but uh, <laughs> if you want to learn about the polarization of wormholes compared to squares of black holes, look at the archive paper. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have time to speak about that if somebody's interested in that. We can talk to yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Petya. Any questions? Thanks, Petya. Very nice talk. Uh, so in these JNW space times, uh, for for some value of the scalar parameter, yes. you can have two disks, right? Two disjoint disks because uh, you have some value of the of the master charge ratio. Yes. Right, right. Yes. So I have you also looked at um, the case where you have two disjoint uh, disks yes. and uh, how the images will look like. Will you yeah. get uh, the same, for example, shape of the null geodesic potential and also the lensing angle? So uh, what I mean is uh, for some value of the mass to scalar charge ratio, 
yes. you have uh, you have a broken two images. Two, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. So for that charge uh, of the for that value of the scalar charge, does this phi p curve look exactly like this? Does it also have a maximum? I, I so uh, I don't really hear very well, but I don't get uh, very well what what you are asking about that. Uh, you are asking whether for some value of the scalar charge much mass ratio you get double. Yes, this is for value from uh, zero to zero point five. Right. Parameter yeah. Okay. Did that was the question. Uh, no, I was just wondering if you always have this maximum of the deflection angle. You have only in this range. So, okay. Okay. Uh, you see, those are the two regimes. So this is when you don't when uh, it looks like structure. So you look at this parameter; it's defined here. And if this parameter is in this range, it looks like like structure. If it is in this range, it has this this, uh, this peak, and then you get the double. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I actually have a question. Can you put the picture again of the of the uh, strong negative in life, the image? Uh, this one? Yeah, yeah, either one. I mean, I'm just curious because this is a naked singularity. Yeah. Where is the singularity here? What do you mean? I mean, yeah, in, in principle, you yeah. see, there's a light ray connecting us to the singularity. This one? A light ray, uh, an algeodesic or a uh, light ray connecting us to the singularity. No, this one is disconnected by light ray. So, this, uh, so, uh, you cannot access because you get this reflective behavior of the two things. Okay. But in, in order to be similar, it's going to be a more massive part of the data. Sorry? So, that's uh, not possible. No, but I'm saying that, I mean, the, the fact that it's a naked singularity means that I can see the singularity from outside the black hole, right? From even from far away. I can see the singularity. Right, so, right, right, right. I, I understand that here I'm not supposed to see the singularity. I'm asking on yeah, the image where, you, where is it? This, this is, uh, you, you I understand that the it's a signature. Cosmic, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, right. right. I understand this is a signature of having a naked singularity, and I understand that you're not supposed to see it in this image. But in principle, in principle, if I if I had a little flashlight near the singularity. Where would I see it on the image? That's the. You will not see it. You will see this parameter. For example, uh, if you don't have this, if you have this uh, problem, uh, just uh, like uh, the shadow problem, or just you put light everywhere around, uh, yeah. Yeah, you will see nothing. Right, right, right. No, but, uh, well, I mean. Basically. So, uh, okay. you don't see the singularity. You see the space time around it. Okay. Um, so okay, depends, maybe I'll ask on the, the light sources. This, this problem right. is very, very dependent on the light sources. Right. And I'm just saying that if you take a light source, you put it very close to the naked singularity. So? Then where would you see it appear on the image? Where, That's, where, you, what? where would it appear on the image? Um, yes. Uh, so uh, you can guess. So, so for example, you see, um, you see this, this orbit. It is a collection of points. So you pick one point, for example, and you see two dots. If you don't uh, have the whole orbit, uh, the whole uh, emitter orbiting around, it is stays in one place. You will see, see two dots. Yes. So, so you will see, you will see, for example, one dot here, one dot here. If uh, it's your, zero, your zero. points are not moving. So this is, this is actually points not moving around. Right. Yes. Okay. So this is. <laughs> maybe, maybe, okay, I think. Um, but if you have a spherical distribution of light sources, mm -hmm. because of all those symmetry you will see in that. I yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, maybe I'll we'll continue this discussion later. Okay. Uh, so, our last speaker for the session is Prashant Kochar Lakota. And, uh, he will tell us about photon rings and spherically symmetric black hole space times.
Hi, I'm Prashant, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, the plan of this talk is to talk about photon rings in arbitrary spherical symmetric space sense so that um, if we want to be able to measure deviations from uh, the Schwarzschild metric, for example, uh, then we, we'd, we'd know what sorts of features would appear in the in the photon images and what, what how these deviations change with the space time. Uh, so this, this, of course, in the future, we hope to extend this to uh, axis symmetric space times, but that, we're not there yet. This is the first step in that direction. Uh, this is work in preparation uh, with my collaborators, Vichano Retzola, Machek Vilgus, and also Ritik Roy, uh, who's a master student at Kudan University. Uh, so uh, the current, this is, oh, oh, why this is not good. So uh, this uh, this is just uh, to set the scene and the current status of uh, tests of the black hole metric uh, with with imaging black hole imaging uh, some can be summarized some, somewhat like this. Uh, so these have typically used uh, the size of the critical curve or the shadow shadow radius, and uh, uh, this, this because uh, this is the single observable that we can see from these uh, that we can obtain from these images that depends only on the space time geometry for metric theory of gravity. So uh, this gives you a good sense of uh, this gives you a good handle on deviations from the space-time metric itself, and so uh, all all such tests have uh, limited to just the size of the critical curve. Uh, this involves uh, so what we actually see in the image is, is a bright ring of emission, which is the lens uh, lens image of the lens direct image of uh, the the zero order image of the accretion disk, and the uh, location of the brightness maximum in this image does not correspond to the uh, critical curve directly. So we must calibrate the difference between the observed emission ring and the theoretical critical curve, and uh, this gives us uh, uh, this gives us then uh, the some bounds on the critical on the shadow diameter shadow radius itself, and with which we can do a, a series of different types. We can ask a series of questions, like for example, whether M87 or Sagittarius are, are black holes with singularities, without singularities, etc., uh, naked singularities, and so on. We could we could test uh, like physical principles like the equivalence principle by looking at various series that modify one of these principles, uh, looking for uh, 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 stationary solutions in them, and again uh, uh, comparing their shadow sizes with uh, with the ones that we get uh, from measurement. So uh, and and as you can uh, as I've summarized, so you can also look for the presence of additional fields like we saw from Petya's talk just now. If you if you take um, um, uh, Einstein gravity and just couple uh, uh, minimally couple a massless scalar field, you don't get uh, you don't get partial black holes anymore except for in one uh, discontinuous limit. So, if for example we saw an image which was totally bright, it would it could be consistent with a with a scalar with the existence of a fundamental scalar that we are not aware of. So these are the sorts of things that we can do with the existence of the shadow or the central brightness depression. And finally, we can also of course test uh, the theories of gravity. So this this program is now really taking off uh, with the HD and uh, with the NGHD, uh, uh, we, we're going to get uh, new observables that could also indicate uh, uh, in, in, that could also de depend on the space-time geometry itself and give us additional handles to uh, set further constraints on on the space-time itself. So here, um, uh, what I'd like to do uh, uh, first, I'll just set the nomenclature here because I realize that uh, I'm working with a slightly different one from uh, uh, previous talks. So uh, I'm going to be looking at uh, higher order images, which form the photon ring region. And these are typically guys that have done at least one full loop uh, around the black hole. So uh, the direct emission is, is, are the guys that uh, don't deflect by even half a loop. Then there's the indirect or lensed image, which, uh, which do an additional half loop. And uh, the higher order images, which I call the photon rings, uh, belong to this photon ring region. So the reason uh, uh, the reason I do this is because, um, for example, in, in, in this paper uh, by Johnson et al., uh, they, they sort of very nicely uh, describe 
uh, the, they define the photon uh, ring region as the as a region where the lensing angle uh, curve that we saw in the previous two talks uh, has uh, the, uh, log logarithmic uh, can be uh, analytically given by a logarithmically uh, diverging uh, curve. So, so that's how we do this. And so these may be accessible as we've seen in this conference with uh, future real life facilities. And uh, but these uh, these photon ring uh, these photon rings are lens images of the uh, of the uh, emission zone, and therefore they depend on the uh, on also the morphology of the emission region. In addition to uh, in addition to the space and geometry itself. So what and all of these guys, however, uh, they approach the critical curve with increasing order. And what we'd like to do here is to understand. Uh, already at what order uh, you get uh, most of the dependence to be from the space and geometry itself and what is the size of uh, magnitude of change with the emission uh, morphology so the uh, the three things that we we'll look at are the change in the, di the diameters widths and uh, okay we will not discuss the fluxes here because i don't think i have time but uh, we'll look at the diameters and the widths of various end rings and try to understand uh, how they change with uh, different um, uh, different emission uh, emission morphologies and emission zone morphologies and uh, try to characterize the uh, also how we get the Lyapunov exponent uh, from these from these diameters and bits. The Lyapunov exponent, as, we, as, as I will uh, try to uh, show eventually, is the perfect observer to break all the degeneracies uh, that we get from purely shadow size measurements. Uh, and, and this is this is pretty cool. So um, uh, so the setup here is that uh, so okay, firstly, I'll just uh, quickly uh, say what what you mean by the photon rings here. So, for an observer that's uh, ortho that's placed orthogonal to this line here, uh, you will see the photon ring to also. Th th so, if you look at this particular uh, purple curve, you can see that uh, it, it's coming from images uh, uh, that that do at least half a turn. And uh, so, these guys. Uh, Depending on the interest of the observer, the uh, the photon ring that appears on the image, uh, uh, the image plane also changes shape uh, from a perfect circle. However, for the for the case where you have an observer looking at a thin a thin disk or a thick disk, but along the axis of the disk in spherically symmetric space times, uh, the curve that you see will be perfectly circular symmetric. So I'll discuss that case first and uh, just mention briefly uh, the the extension to inclined disks and inclined thick disks. Uh, rather than uh, view, disks view from an inclined observer. So what I mean uh, is just this. Uh, this this cartoon just shows uh, the different morph the emission region emission zone morphologies that I'm, I'm going to be looking at. Uh, so this one is just a thin disk viewed uh, by a viewed face on. This is a thin disk viewed from an inclination. This is what I'm calling a geometrically thick disk. So it's a very simple toy model. Uh, we have uh, it's uh, it's the mid plane of the disk is in the in the equatorial plane of the black hole. The, this is the axis of the disk, and in this case, the observer is in the uh, has zero inclination. And uh, the parameter here that I will use is this opening angle of the disk. So it's like a wedge-shaped region. This is what I this is what I'm going to mean by a geometrically thick disk in this uh, in this talk. And there's also finally the case where you see the geometrically thick disk uh, from a from a from an inclination. And also you have uh, a spherical spherically emitting region that, and in this case, the inclination of the observer doesn't matter because. Yeah, the image is always going to be circularly centered. So all of these are sort of, or at least these two cases are sort of test cases to see what actually happens when you have, uh, you know, equilibrium tori or accretion onto the uh, accretion onto the black hole itself. So these will give us some nice, simple analytic handles for how, uh, what, uh, how the photon ring structure changes with changes in, for example, the inner edge of the disk, the outer edge of the disk, and also with the geometrical, uh, o o the half opening angle of the disk. Uh, and and also one more thing I'd like to say is that uh, so uh, this this uh, we choose this um, we choose a geometrical model because it sort of interpolates smoothly between the thin disk and the thick disk uh, and, and the spherical accretion. Uh, so the thin disk would be uh, correspond to uh, opening angle of zero, whereas the spherical accretion would correspond to an opening angle of pi, by, pi over two. So this gives us this also allows us to in this very toy uh, setting uh, understand how the photon ring uh, structure, the diameter and width. Changes with the geometrical thickness of the of the emitting region. Okay, so um, so we consider a spherically arbitrary spherically symmetric space uh, space times like this, in which uh, you can separate the null geodesic equation, uh, geodesic equation, and you can write down uh, the tangent to arbitrary null geodesics anywhere in the space time in this way. Uh, and and what this, what uh, uh, in in these spherically symmetric space times, as we've heard just now. 
two really uh, sim uh, extremely simplifying nice things happen. One, the structure of a space-like hypersurface uh, is, in is, is just concentric uh, spheres uh, nested, uh, with concentric also to the sing uh, singularity itself. This is, this is part one. So if you wanted to look at uh, deflections and all of these other things, you can actually use 3D geometry, 3D Euclidean geometry te techniques because this, uh, because this nice foliation structure exists. And the second thing is that uh, geodesics move on uh, planes, uh, 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 all null geodesic orbits are planar orbits. So what you could do is that you could construct the plane corresponding to uh, the, the, the plane containing the singularity and the emitting point and the singularity and, and the observing point. So this forms a plane and all photons, uh, that, uh, I mean, these, these, are the only, these are the photons that we have interest to us when looking at uh, photons emitted from the emitting point reaching the observing point. And these all lie exactly in this plane. So you can again do just uh, planar geometry and write down the net deflection angle in that plane alone. Um, so here we write down for, for two classes of orbits, uh, initially uh, both emitted at a radial, at a radius R emit, and um, either with, out, with initially outgoing uh, radial velocity or ingoing radial velocity. And this, uh, this is just, you can, you can write down the net deflection as just this integral, uh, which is an integral over, oh, these are all dr, sorry, uh, integral over dr, where uh, the, the, the integral is just k phi over k, uh, k r. Um, so this is this really nice picture from this paper. Uh, so the, the, what you can do when you're looking at things uh, face on is that for the thin disk case, you can see that the direct image just uh, corresponds to a total deflection of pi over two, the indirect image uh, in my nomenclature uh, corresponds to a total deflection of uh, pi, pi plus pi over 2. And the first photon ring, which, which I'm calling the first photon ring here, corresponds to a total deflection of uh, pi plus pi plus pi by 2. So that's pi pi by 2. So in this case, uh, the n equal to whatever rings that I'll be talking about, they all correspond to pi, uh, 3 pi by 2 plus n pi. So it's a very simple, uh, uh, simple calculation that we can make. Now, in the case of this uh, inclined, uh, sorry, in this wedge shaped emission, you can already read off what the net deflection must be. So if you have the deflection coming from, from this part of the, this, uh, this side of the disk, uh, because it's uh, certainly symmetric, uh, you, you can, you can ca calculate the net deflection to be uh, from the front face to be essentially uh, pi pi by two minus by two minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so the net deflection to be pi pi by two uh, minus uh, theta naught and uh, the maximum deflection to be pi pi by two plus theta naught. Anyway, so it's nice, we can make some very nice, simple, uh, uh, we can make simple, we can write down simple conditions that uh, help us locate where the, uh, where the uh, photon rings are. And okay, uh, and so the, uh, the other conditions that we write down in this case, and this for an inclined observer, we have things also for the, uh, for, uh, sorry, for, for the, for, for the, for these uh, disk viewed face on, we can also write similar equations for disk viewed, uh, at an inclination, which I will not uh, show here uh, yet. So uh, we can also define the diameter of the ring to be just two times the uh, location of the outer edge of the ring, ring, and the width to be just the difference in the outer and the inner edge of the end ring. And uh, what, I, what, what I'd like to uh, impress on you, which may, almost everybody here may already know, is that the outer edge of the uh, of the photon ring is just the, uh, the nth order image of the outer edge of the uh, emission emitting region itself. And, and vice versa for the inner edge. So for the Schwarzschild space time, I'll skip this. Uh, for the Schwarzschild space time, uh, you, can, you can compute how the outer edge of the n equal to one, n equal to two, n equal to three ring, uh, the fractional uh, difference from the shadow boundary, how that changes with the, with the ch with change in the outer edge of the emission region in the bulk itself. So this curve, the, the y-axis is like on the image plane, whereas the, uh, the x-axis is on in the bulk itself. So this tells us that there is some dependence on um, there's some limit, some dependence of the diameter, or the fractional diameter on on the on where the outer edge of the emitting region is, and this also tells us uh, how the how the uh, inner edge of the uh, um, uh, photon ring depends on the inner edge of the emitting region. So uh, we have we can we can do all this and we can set bounds on how uh, things vary. So this figure shows us that uh, shows us it shows us the topological structure of the photon ring region. Uh, depending on the uh, depending, so we consider two different emit, emitting emission region morphologies here. Um, uh, so uh, on the left, we have uh, we have emission from a thin disk viewed from a face on observer. In this case, the inner edge uh, is, is at 6m, inner edge of the disk is at 6m, the outer edge is at infinity, and the opening angle is zero. 
and for the for emission from the spherical regions as shown on the right, the uh, inner edge is at the horizon, the outer edge is at infinity, and theta opening angle is pi over two. So what you see in this case is that there is hierarchy of n rings, which between which there is uh, there are empty gaps, whereas in this case you have all the rings that are overlapping on on top of each other, and uh, uh, th this is an effect essentially of where you where you set the inner edge of the uh, emission region. Because once you have an, a bunch of emission coming from inside the photon sphere, as, as one would expect in, uh, in, for example, accreting systems, you would never have these sorts of gaps, but uh, you would just have um, uh, photon rings stacked on top of each other. Um, so this, this, uh, this plot here shows uh, a change in the photon ring diameter on the left and the width, uh, the n equal to one diameter, uh, with the uh, outer boundary on the y-axis and, and the opening angle on the x-axis, the geometrical thickness. And this shows us that essentially the photon in diameter doesn't change much with the uh, with where you set the outer location. So it mostly depends on uh, on the on the geometric height of the of the disk itself of the emitting region. And this figure shows us. So so in this figure we just set the uh, R out to be at infinity, and uh, the width, which depends on both the inner edge, outer edge, and also the opening angle, also demonstrates the same same feature that uh, you have some dependence with the uh, with the uh, with the geometrical, the more, more, most of the primary dependence is with the geometrical thickness of the emitting region. Um, okay, I'll just pick this. So this is for an inclined observer, uh, and these these, uh, these are not directly the the Bardeen coordinates, but these are the fractional uh, deviations from the critical curve. Uh, so you see, you can you can also compute the change in the appearance of the disk of the photon ring with uh, inclination, and you see this nice flip structure, which is. You know, these become elongated in one direction for the n equal to one ring, and in the other direction for the n equal to two ring. And this, this sort of uh, the stuff that we've heard of uh, earlier as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I just have two more slides. So this shows us uh, what the change in the diameter is for three different classes of uh, black holes, uh, one one parameter black holes. These are uh, reservoirs for for black holes, and this tells us uh, how the diameters vary with the uh, the red curves correspond to changes in the horizon. Uh, the changes in the blue, uh, in the green curve, uh, 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 capture changes in the 1pn parameter, and the blue uh, correspond to the 2pn parameter. So what you can see here is that there is some dependence that we can actually pick out from the size of the uh, size of the uh, uh, photon rings, and also uh, this figure shows you uh, where the two photon rings widths differ uh, from, uh, like depending on what uh, emission morphology you are using. And this is for the n equal to 2 ring, the same stuff. And this, uh, this again is the same thing that I showed you in the previous slide, but for the widths. And so you, you can see that we, all of these things track uh, the, the deviation in the space time. And finally here, you can extract the Lyapunov no exponent in two ways. Uh, this is not uh, super feasible, but uh, this, you look at the fractional diameter uh, of the, of two, of the n equal to one and two photon rings. And you can come, you can, you see that the uh, Lyapunov no exponent changes in this particular way with space time geometry. And you can see that if you do it independent of the emission morphology, this really does track essentially the, the change in the space and geometry itself. And on the right, you can you can extract the Lyapunov exponent exactly again from the widths of the rings, and you get the you get uh, an excellent agreement between these two, uh, independent of what uh, what morphology you're using for the what what is happening in the space and geometry. This is the main plot, uh, at least to me. So here I plot the isocontours of constant Lyapunov uh, ex, uh, the isocontours of the Lyapunov exponent, uh, actually uh, the Lyapunov exponent over pi minus one. So the change from Schwarzschild. Schwarzschild is at the center in all these plots, and it's the value there is it, it's, it's zero isocontour. So for different um, emission, uh, so for thin disk and spherical location, I have two different curves, and we plot the isocontours, and you can see that clearly there's uh, these guys uh, change with space time geometry, which is uh, which, which are the parameters that uh, the space time is controlled by the x axis and the y axis parameters. So these are three different classes of two parameter black hole solutions. Most important thing is that these red curves that I have here. In each of these plots, these red curves, they are isocontours of the shadow size. And if you look at look at the uh, the angle between the shadow size and the uh, and the uh, Lyapunov exponent, this exactly breaks the DMVC. So if we were to measure the Lyapunov exponent, we'd actually isolate the space time parameters, uh, space time geometry exactly, uh, not just a uh, deviation from Schwarzschild, but we would actually be able to say that this is what the space time is. Of course, this holds only for two dimensional uh, two two parameter black holes because we will still have just two uh, two numbers. The shadow size and the Lyapunov exponent, but in principle, this is uh, this is something really exciting that we could do with the NGSC. And uh, yeah, uh, that, that I'll just leave my conclusion on that. So, sorry for going over time.
We have time for a quick question, Michael. Yeah, this is a really beautiful work. I, is this a paper you already published or? No, we, we, we hope to put it out later this month. So. Oh, okay, well, I, I'd love to see it when it's ready. Uh, my question is, uh, the Lyapunov exponent is also very sensitive to the spin in the black hole. Yes. Do you so. think that um, you know, adding spin will change these conclusions significantly, or do you think that this is a, a really different uh, relationship between the Lyapunov exponent and diameter than what you see in Kerr? Um, this is exactly what I want to uh, what I want to explore, uh, but I think there would be ways uh, to to draw similar uh, plots like this, uh, because of course the Lyapunov exponent, uh, as Shahar was uh, letting us uh, telling us yesterday, it depends on which which part of the photon that you're actually looking at. So we'd have to we probably I mean if you look at the if you look at the uh, if you look at the image plane and you see a photon ring, the Lyapunov exponent varies with the angle. Uh, for in in rotating space times, uh, so we'd have to we'd have to also probably uh, look at slices and azimuthal slices and draw plots for each of those slices, and that would probably that would probably do the job. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. All right, uh, we can continue the discussion over coffee. So let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. Let's uh, thank all the speakers once again for the session.